gives each one of us just so much time in which to complete the work that he's given us to do. To some he gives a long period of time, to others he gives a very brief period of time, but for whatever time he gives us, our responsibility is to serve him. Work for the night is coming, and we see that that is what is taking place as God begins to move Philip in his ministry in Acts chapter 8, verses 25 and 26. So take your Bibles and turn with me there if you will. And last week we began the transition of the great revival at Samaria down to a desert ministry, which will end with 19 years of church planting. And we'll see that as we move a little farther through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8 and verse 25, which was the verse we studied last week. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again that we have the privilege of studying your word. The same word that was preached in those villages of the Samaritans. The good news, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ the wonderful good news that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And as we have seen in between the Samaritans, it is a delight, Father, to have your word in our possession and in our language. We pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we thank you for this time and pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall last week we saw that verse 25 here in Acts 8 is a transition verse. It's a verse that is moving us from one major section of the book of Acts into the next major section of the book. And we saw the three things that happened. First, we saw that Philip's evangelistic revival was over. Doesn't it seem sad to see a revival end? You know, historically, though, God does three things when he wants to make an impact through revival. He makes an impact in three ways. The timing of the revival the location of the revival, and the people of the revival. As I was meditating on that this week and thinking about it, it's very clear that God chooses the time when he will send his spirit to bring revival. 
That is true in the revivals of the Old Testament. That is true of the revivals that we see in the New Testament, not only in the book of Acts, but also in the passages in the doctrinal epistles where Paul speaks back to the time when those groups of people came to Christ, some in very difficult situations, some out of great carnality and wickedness, others in times of great distress and in times of persecution and trial, some in the face of false doctrine. But it was God in every case who sovereignly chose the time that he would send his spirit to bring revival. God is the one who opens the revival in his time. God is the one who closes the revival in his time. But the thing to notice is that the timing of the revival is always limited. The Spirit of God moves for a definitive period of time, and then the Spirit of God sovereignly chooses to close down the revival when the specific group of his elect have responded to the gospel call. The second thing that we note about this revival, which is a transition revival, is the location. God chooses unlikely places in which he will move his hand. In this case, it was Samaria. But looking at church history, we discover major revivals in Wales, for example, the great Welsh revival, the first great awakening in 1740 and 1741 in the times of George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, and Jonathan Edwards. Then we see God waited for 50 years until the second great awakening in the 1790s. But it was at that time, and not the earlier time, but at that time that God gave birth to many missionary societies, the founding of Christian academies, the founding of Christian colleges, the founding of Christian theological seminaries. Most of us perhaps do not know about the great Kentucky revival in the early 1800s, which was actually brought about by Presbyterian ministers. That was the beginning of what's been known as the camp meeting movement. And there were, during that time, mass gatherings where people would travel by horseback for hundreds of miles to come to these meetings, and especially for the Lord's table. They would be gathered from the mountains all over Kentucky so that they might come and partake of the Lord's table. There were major revivals in the Confederate Army during the war between the states. There were corresponding revivals in the Union Army. There were further revivals at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. And what I've mentioned here is merely considering revivals in the United States at scattered locations in the North and South, but there were additional revivals out in the West. There were additional revivals even up in Alaska. There were revivals elsewhere in the world that many people have never even heard of. Special revivals in the British Isles, in Scandinavia, in Africa, India. In fact, some going on today that we barely hear about here in the United States. Revivals in China under Hudson Taylor and others. In the New Hebrides by Presbyterian John Patton and many others. God takes and his spirit moves at unique times in unique locations and sometimes missionaries will serve for many years and live and die on the mission field and never see revival and suddenly God brings someone some are trained many are untrained but his spirit is the one that brings the revival Jesus said I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it that shows a militant church. It is not the church fortified, waiting for Satan's attack. It is the church militant. The gates do not move. It is the church that moves against the gates of hell. 
And that's what we see when we see God moving in revival. And he chooses many different locations throughout history. And that brings us to the third issue of revival, which is the people. Both the people whom he uses to lead the revival and the people who are the subjects of the revival. You all know of the revivals of the Wesley brothers. They were Arminians. And George Whitfield at the same time, a predestinarian. And Baptists of both persuasions, and particularly in this country and among the uneducated folk, there were both the hardcore premillennial or, or, or predestinarian Baptists and there were the free will Baptists. And they had a great impact all across the South many people coming to Christ through both of their preaching. But it's not merely Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists. Did you know that in the 1770s there was a great revival under the preaching of an Anglican clergyman, Devereux Jarrett? We don't normally think of the Anglicans as being the ones who led revivals, and yet here was one. The Civil War revivals were led by both Armenian preachers and Calvinists, and as the years passed, the United States saw great revivals under Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey, Billy Sunday and Charles Finney. And God, much to the dismay of some, God moved his hand on both Arminians and Predestinarians, though at times they bitterly opposed each other. But we need to remember that when we're talking about revival, when we're talking about a great ingathering of people with the gospel of Christ, the key issue is preaching salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, preaching who Jesus is and what he did, that men are lost sinners, that they are under the wrath and judgment of God, and it is only God who can reach their hearts and touch those who are dead and make them alive again. God is sovereign in salvation, and God, yes, he uses whom he will in spite of our thoughts that he should do something differently. And no doubt there were those at Samaria who thought that it was not time for Philip to leave. Perhaps if the apostles wondered as to whether or not this revival would continue, they knew they were going back to Jerusalem. But God had a new plan for Philip. He was going to do a new work with Philip. He would sustain that Samaritan revival for a period of time as that church had been planted and for about two centuries thereafter before it defected and became nothing. As we read the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches, every one of them had at one point experienced a revival. At one point, God had sent someone to each of those churches before they were churches. Someone who had come to those communities and through the preaching of the word had seen many people saved and built into Bible preaching churches. The seven epistles of Jesus, which are those seven letters in the book of Revelation, are written to those churches to warn them and with some to commend them, but in all cases to remind them from whence they had come and to be on guard lest their church should be removed. The Holy Spirit comes in special ways to make revival and then those who perhaps were key in the founding of those churches and revivals are moved to other ministries. It's a warning to us today. The point is clear as we look at history and as we look at the New Testament. God opened the revival in Samaria. God closed the revival in Samaria. God then sent his ambassadors to other works. It should not be a surprise to us when an era passes in which God was doing a special work in a special location at a special time with special 
people. God is not obligated to continue to do things in the way that we expect or that we childishly require. God calls, he gifts, and sends people whom we consider great men at crucial points in history when key battles must be won. He gives those men the courage and the strength to do his will, and then he calls them home. God does not always choose to keep a particular battlefront open with the troops at that location moving forward. God uses divine strategy in the heavenly war against evil. He chooses which captives to release from Satan's clutches. For the world is blinded by Satan, and those who are unsaved are bound by his chains. And it is God who chooses which captives to release from Satan's clutches and leaves others alone. The second thing that we saw in our transition last week was the problem with Simon the sorcerer had to be resolved so that Simon would not be a problem to the fledgling church in Samaria because neither Philip nor the apostles could leave until that very serious issue had been resolved. And then the third thing that we saw, the final thing that we saw, was that the apostles completed their twofold mission. Number one, to confirm that the Holy Spirit really was working in Samaria and had chosen to add Samaritans to the church on a co-equal basis with the Jews. And secondly, to make sure that there were apostles present so that the Samaritans would receive the Holy Spirit under apostolic authority. In that way, no one could say that the Samaritans were inferior in the church, sort of second-class Christians. By the way, a question arose last week concerning whether the Philip in Acts 8 was one of the apostles. There was an apostle by the name of Philip, but we know specifically that this was not the apostle Philip in Acts chapter 8 because of the statement in Acts 8.1. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his, that is, unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Then verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Jerusalem of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So we're specifically told that the apostles remained behind at Jerusalem, and it was the rest of the church that was scattered, including the deacons, because Stephen was the first most outstanding deacon appointed in Acts chapter 6, and he was killed. Philip is the second deacon in the list, and he steps in after the martyrdom of Stephen. Verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. We noted also last week that verse 25, being a transition verse, had several different partings occurring in it. The Samaritan revival and the parting of the leaders who led the revival. The parting of the apostles from Philip. Philip departing from Samaria and heading on a new commission. We also noted how interesting it is that God gave very little space to what the apostles were doing versus what Philip was doing and noted that God can magnify any ministry in which he places his hand and his blessing, no matter whether or not you have what are considered the great gifts or the humble gifts. And as we saw this morning, God delights to use the humble gifts to glorify his name. We were also reminded that the work of God is not stagnant after a major spiritual battle is finished. There is never any time for letting up the work, but God continues to send his shock troops into the next assignment. We saw that the apostles testified and preached the word, and we noted that 
What is going on here is a personal witness as well as a proclamation of the word and a confirmation of the message which Philip had brought. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The apostles then had their evangelistic trip back to Jerusalem where they preached in many other smaller Samaritan towns. But the thing that was the overarching point last week was the key to spiritual success for both Philip and the apostles was the removal of carnality in Samaria. And carnality is one of the chief problems in the church in America today. We listed a few of the things, carnal lifestyle, carnal worship, carnal insipid preaching, carnal music, carnal clothing, carnal activities, carnal goals, carnal motives, carnal ambitions, and carnal doctrine. The church in America is loaded with carnality, and that is one of the primary reasons that we do not see the power of God moving among us as he has done so in the past. We won't cover all of the different things that relate to carnality, but that was a very important message. In fact, someone came up to me afterwards and told me that a church where they had been going uh, doesn't recognize carnality does not think it exists and that they get into a, a discussion on that subject almost every week. It is a sovereign grace type of church and yet they do not believe that carnality exists. Even though major passages in major doctrinal epistles in the New Testament, extended passages deal with that particular subject. Tonight, Desert Ministries. Here we find God sending Philip to the desert on an evangelistic endeavor in verse 26. Often what we think of as big successes are followed by downsizing. However, the downsizing for Philip opens a greater ministry than the Samaritan revival, and the new ministry historically affected the entire nation of Ethiopia for centuries, Plus, it opened up, as we've mentioned tonight, 19 years of successful church planting. Verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. There's a lot packed into that little verse. First of all, it tells us a lot of things about Philip himself and about Philip's motives. It first tells us that this is not a matter of burnout. Philip didn't head out of Samaria because he was utterly exhausted after the spiritual exertion that he had there in Samaria. Elijah had experienced burnout after his contest with the prophets of Baal. Then he has run to Jezebel ahead of Ahab's chariot. Then his threat from Jezebel. Then his fleeing all the way down to the south where he sat under a juniper tree and told the Lord, I'm not better than my father's, I'd rather die. He rests there, and he wakes up, and he's provided with a cruise of water and bread, and he sleeps again, and wakes up, and he eats again, and then in the strength of that angelic food, he travels 40 day days down to Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, where God recommissions him and tells him, to commission Elisha to follow him. No, it was not burnout. The second thing we can discover as we look at the text is that this was not a matter of self-will, that he decided he was going to get up and he was going to go and he was going to do his thing because, after all, now he was truly a seasoned and qualified evangelist and he could handle it. This was not a matter of self-will. Self-will is the kind of thing that we see manifested in people who are carnal and people who then get themselves into deeper trouble. For example, Samson. Samson was a man of self-will. Where he wanted to go, he went. What he wanted to do, he did. It didn't matter what his parents said. It didn't matter what anybody said. If the Philistines tried to lock him in, he'd walk down to the city gates, rip them off their hinges, carry them to the top of the hill, and drop them on the top of the hill. Samson was a self-willed man. But there came a time when he did not get to go where he wanted to go. He did not get to do what he wanted to do. Though he thought he would, 
You recall how Delilah had tempted him over and over, tormenting him, it says, because he would not tell her his secret strength. And finally, he told her all his heart. A woman with whom he was immorally involved. And he revealed the source of his strength. I wonder how many nations have been betrayed throughout history by immoral women who have seduced men in positions of authority until they revealed the strength of their nation and their nation was damaged badly or destroyed. You recall Samson, the self-willed man, fell asleep on Delilah's lap and she cut off the locks of his hair. And then she said, as she had said before at other times, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he said, I will shake myself and go out as before. But he wist not that the spirit of God had departed from him. And they took him and they bound him and they put out his eyes and they made him to grind. They forgot that his hair would grow. And you know the end of the story, how he pushed the pillars apart and 3,000 Philistines at once were killed and Samson was killed in the wreckage. No, this is not a matter of self-will, but of clear divine direction. Number three, it was not a matter of boredom in seeking another ministry. Did you know that the average length of time that a preacher stays in a church in the United States today is between two and three years? And then they get itchy feet. And then they want to move on someplace else. And they want to go to some bigger or better or better paying or more prestigious or more comfortable ministry. No, this is not going to a more comfortable ministry. This is not a matter of boredom. Where Philip was, there was plenty of excitement. In fact, where God was sending him would be what would appear to most to be a matter of boredom there. It was not a matter of running from a fight because Philip had already been victorious in his ministry at Samaria. He's leaving it at the height of success. So that raises for us the question of divine direction. How do you know God's will? How do you know when you have divine direction? How do you know what is the next step that God wants you to take? Well, it was fairly easy for Philip because Philip had an audible, articulate, supernatural manifestation. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, and he gave him a very clear, articulate message. You and I no longer have divine, articulate, audible, supernatural manifestations as they did in the apostolic period. We've been studying that for the last 14 messages on the gifts on Sunday morning. So what does God use today to give divine direction? Well, the first and obvious thing, the foundation stone for the believer, is the scriptures, the word of God, the Bible. And God will never call you or direct you to do something that is contrary to the word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired the scripture. It reveals the accurate, precise will of God. We've talked about that a great deal in the other services, so we'll only give a brief outline tonight. But the scriptures will never contradict what the Holy Spirit moves you to do and vice versa. God always functions according to the principles that he has already laid down in his word. There are many passages of scripture that deal with that. You know, I'm sure many of them. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Which way should you go? What's the path in which you should walk? The word of God will give it to you. You know Psalm 119, verse 11, but verses 9 and 10 also that precede that give us the truth that God uses the scripture to direct a young man's way. 
Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, that is, the place that he's walking, the way that he's going, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Now, verse 10 is key. If you want God's word to give you understanding on the way that you should go, notice what David says. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. I don't want to get off the path. What precedes the not getting off the path? It is seeking God with your whole heart. Not lackadaisically, not sporadically, not hesitantly, not doubtfully, but seeking God with your whole heart. That's what keeps you from getting off the path. In fact, God's word is so important to you that you do verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. One of the key issues of staying on the path is the avoidance of sin. Do you want to know God's will for your life? The first thing you need to do is make sure that the path that you're walking on is not a path that is cluttered with sin. When we learn to walk that path, we suddenly discover that God makes his will very clear to us. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And in the New Testament, how clear is Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word helps you to sift out the wrong intents. You say you want to know the will of God, but you've actually got a hidden agenda that you're going to be able to tell everyone you prayed about it, you studied the Bible about it, but you actually ended up doing what you wanted to do. The scripture is like a sword that cuts off those things. It gets rid of the ulterior motives. It gets rid of the hidden agenda. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, we studied quite a few elimination principles. I'll just go through them quickly for you. Uh, this is the way to, when you don't really know God's will, to begin to eliminate certain things from it. First, is what you want to do commanded in Scripture? If so, you must do it. Second, is it prohibited in Scripture? If it is prohibited, God is not leading you that way. Third, is there a general principle stated, even though, for example, the Bible does not say, thou shalt not smoke. But God has given us a principle that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if any man defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. Which temple you are. Is there a principle that directly applies to the issue of whether this is God's will or not? Next, does it cause a weaker brother to stumble? If it does, it's out. Does it glorify God in a positive manner? Paul tells us, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Not just is it neutral, is it positively for the glory of God? You ask the question, does it dim my testimony before a lost world, even though I might think that it is permissible in the strictest sense of the word? Then you ask the question, does it edify and build up the church? Because that is what we are supposed to be doing all the time. Then you ask the question, and we discussed this somewhat this morning, is it appropriate use of the gifts that I have been given, or am I trying to exercise a responsibility or a gift that I do not have? If you can get past all of those, you will come to the point whereby you can claim the last principle. 
the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you get past all those questions, God will give you peace, his perfect peace in your heart, so that you will know what his will is. The second way in which we determine the will of God, and this is particularly for those who are younger and not yet been married, but his parents. Oh, there are so many verses in scripture, I'll read you just a few. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, that is, it will cause beauty and honor, and they will also be, he says, chains about thy neck. They will restrain you from doing the things that you should not. Proverbs 6.20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Chapter 23, verse 22, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Couldn't do that unless the body is dead. The next way in which we determine God's will and God's calling is prayer with this caveat. Prayer with the intense desire to know and do the will of God. We're not talking about prayer that has its own predetermined choice, looking for God's stamp of approval on our choice. I think you probably remember when we were studying the will of God. And you know that God wants us to know and do his will more than we want to know and do his will. It is his greater desire than ours that we know and do his will. He's not hiding it from us. I'll read you just a few verses on this for our time is fleeing by. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. First Chronicles 22, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build the sanctuary of the Lord God, to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 11, And after them out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. But then we find the contrast in the very next chapter. And he did evil because he prepared not to seek his heart, to seek the Lord. You get the idea. This intense desire to know and do God's will is what brings God's blessing, and what brings his curse is when we do not prepare our heart to seek the Lord, then we will automatically fall into evil, for we will get off on the wrong path. The way of the wicked is as darkness, they know not at what they stumble. Psalm 34.10 The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Isaiah 65 Call unto me and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Oh, that we would call on God the way that he tells us to call on him, because he has a promise attached. I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Hebrews 4.16 Oh, what a great blessing it is to have the book of Hebrews. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you need to know what God has for you? You can come boldly to his throne of grace. 
The third line of seeking the will of God is the mentoring leaders and the godly leaders that you know. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you and have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And ten verses later in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Of course, there are many others that folks usually go to first. They go and they talk to their friends about it. They talk to people at work about it. Uh, they uh, perhaps uh, use you know, the jelly bean method where you, know, you reach into the jar and see which color jelly bean you get, and that uh, determines your yes and no. By the way, that's an occultic type of practice. Don't do that. Uh, but people use all kinds of other ways. But these are the principal ways that God has given to us when we are seeking his will. So in conclusion on that, you will not have a special angelic messenger speak God's will to you audibly. However, you can definitively know the will of God by applying these biblical principles. Again, God wants you to know and do his will more than you want to know and do his will. So if you really want to know his will, apply those biblical principles and he will definitely help you to know and do his will and then he will give you the power to do it. The third thing that we notice here in this verse is God did not give all of his instruction at once. Did you notice that in verse 26? The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. He didn't say, now look, what you're looking out for is a rich guy in a chariot. And he's going to be black, and he's going to be reading the scroll, and uh, when you see that, you know you got your target. He gave him what we would consider, although it's very specific directions, it's kind of broad, isn't it? Philip is merely told, go south from Samaria. He's to go generally toward a road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. He's not specifically told where to intersect that road or whether to go first to Jerusalem and then get on the road that heads toward Gaza or whether to head toward Gaza and intersect the road in the middle at some point. Samaria is north and east. Jerusalem is south of Samaria and east. Gaza is even further south, but it's west on the coast. If you look at an ancient map, there are several different routes that Philip could have taken. God told him, go south, hit the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. You know, God is obviously in control of how the Ethiopian eunuch is getting to Jerusalem, how long he's staying at Jerusalem, and when he's heading back. He knows how far it is from Samaria down to the meeting point. He knows how fast Philip will be able to travel. God has already done all the trigonometry in his divine plan to make sure that the lines intersect at exactly the right point. Philip doesn't have to know all that. All Philip has to do is obey the best he can, the instructions that he's been given. You and I always want to know all the details, and then we want to run it through our own grid before we obey. That's not the way God works. God gives us some basic instructions and says, let's see if you can obey the simple instructions. He didn't tell Philip how fast to travel, when to stop and rest, when to get a drink, which road to take, and whether or not he would have to walk in the dark. He just told him, get moving. And then God takes care of the details of the appointment. Dear folks, that's what God wants us to do. He has given us his general directions in the word of God. 
There's nothing here that says get on bus number 15 to Camden at 9.45 in the morning. And when you get on the bus, you will see a guy that is doing such and such, and he's the one I want you to witness to. Now, sometimes God gave directions like that to the apostles while Jesus was still walking on earth, like going in for Passover. He said, look for this guy. He's going to have a pitcher of water, and you follow him, and the house that he goes into is where we'll hold the Passover. We're past that. We suddenly have a situation now where God is teaching believers to learn to obey what he says and then he will bring the results. A great lesson out of this particular passage that we see here. When God calls us to do something, there are usually several alternative routes that we can take to get to the point of appointment. For example, perhaps you know through the process that we've described above, that God has called you to be a missionary in Argentina. There are several Bible schools or colleges at which you could prepare. There are several missionary agencies that have or are planning to have ministries in Argentina. Some preparation takes longer than other preparation, depending on the type of ministry that you know God has called you to perform. To be a missionary teacher takes fewer years to prepare than preparing to be a seminary professor. But as you walk by faith, God will open certain doors and he will close other doors. Philip knew that he had to get on the Jerusalem-Gaza highway, but God didn't tell him exactly where. However, God did tell him to get moving. As Philip was in Samaria, there was a certain man on his way to Jerusalem for a specific period of time, traveling at a specific rate of speed, resting at certain locations, stopping to eat for specific lengths of time, and God planned a divine appointment where he would interact and intersect with Philip while doing a very specific activity. Philip didn't get to him before he read Isaiah 53. Philip didn't get to him after he read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 takes about three minutes to read through. That is a very specific point in time. The point is this. When you know God has called you to do something in some act of service, don't sit on your hands wondering and fretting about it. Get moving. God did not let him stop in Jerusalem. Did you notice that? Jerusalem was the capital city. That's the place of most convenience. The Ethiopian eunuch was going to Jerusalem and returning from Jerusalem. God could have delayed the Ethiopian eunuch in Jerusalem. And Philip could have actually reached him in Jerusalem. God didn't do that. Because, you see, Jerusalem is not only the capital, the place of most convenience, the place with the biggest church, the place to give an exciting missionary report, the place for fellowship, the place for further personal growth. How many in America today want further personal growth? And they do it in all kinds of odd ways. Jerusalem was the place for recreation and relaxation. But Jerusalem was also the place where he would be tempted to stop. Just like the prophet who pronounced judgment on Jeroboam's false altar, it said, oh, altar, oh, altar, your ashes are going to be poured out. And Josiah is going to be the one that rips this place up. And God had told him, you go and pronounce that. And Jeroboam reached out his hand to see, said, seize him. And the hand withered up. And he said, oh, pray for my hand. And so the prophet did. And God stretched his hand out. So he said, come home, have you lunch? The prophet said, no, I'm not going to. He headed down the road. But an old prophet who had been there, an old prophet who should have proclaimed the word of God, an old prophet who knew the scriptures and yet did not speak out against the wickedness of Jeroboam and his altar, he sat after the true prophet of God and said, an angel of God appeared to me and said, come back and have lunch with the old prophet. And he did. And as he's eating lunch, the old prophet gets a message from God and says, you disobeyed God. You believed a false report 
God had told you to do this and God didn't tell you not to do this. You just heard a message from me and now God is going to kill you. And so after lunch, the old prophet gave him his donkey. He got on his donkey. Would make a little faster time. Maybe he could catch up to the place where, you know, where he had been and, and keep on going and still get back home at the same time. And a lion met him in the way and killed him. But it was a supernatural event because the donkey didn't panic. The donkey didn't run away. The lion didn't run away. People coming down the road saw it. Here's a donkey standing next to a lion, standing next to a dead man. And it came to the old prophet. And so he went and got the dead body of the prophet who disobeyed God and brought it back to the city and buried him in his own sepulcher. You see, there was a big temptation to stop at Jerusalem. But God wanted to make sure that he didn't stop at Jerusalem, that he got all the way to Gaza, because one of God's elect was on the road who would be the key to changing an entire nation. Dear folks, when God has called you to do something, don't stop in Jerusalem along the way. God told him to head for Gaza. Now, you know where Gaza is today. You know all about the Gaza Strip. You hear it on the news. You know that the city of Gaza is the place of the administration of the Gaza Strip. It's the center of Hamas and the PLO. It's crowded with Arab refugees. It's the place from which modern Israel suffers many of its missile attacks. Gaza has never been a nice place for nice people doing nice things. Gaza was one of the five cities of the Philistines that gave constant agony and grief to David and ancient Israel. Gaza was the place where Samson showed off his strength and that was the place of his humiliation. You know, it's rather interesting, as we said before, God enjoys reaching down into odd and awkward places to show forth his glory and his mercy and his grace. But did you notice, it was not to Gaza that God showed his grace, but to someone who was passing through Gaza. And to make his point, God reminds Philip that Gaza is desert. You know, many men of God have had to first have a desert experience before God finally used them. And so the question becomes, how will we respond to the desert experiences of life through which God leads us? Exodus 3.1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Exodus chapter 5, now standing before Pharaoh, the children of Israel, they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. How they would rue those words years later. They only wanted to spend three days in the desert. God let them spend 40 years in the desert. Chapter 19, verse 2. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. It was a desert right before they got the law of God. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. The desert, a place of judgment and death. And that's emphasized for us in Numbers 33, 13 chapters later. It says, they removed from the desert of Sinai and pitched at Kibrot Chata'ava which we're told means luster's graves, because they had lusted for all the things that they used to have in Egypt. And God killed them 
and thousands were buried there. Desert experiences. How will you respond to the desert experience when you go through it? Think of Elijah at the juniper in Mount Horeb. We talked about that earlier. How he fled from the face of Jezebel. Think about the desert experience of Job. Where all of his wealth is stolen. Where all of his children are killed. Where his body is covered with grotesque sores where he has the harassment of a nagging wife telling him, curse God and die. Where he has so-called friends sitting and criticizing him and trying to poke holes in his argument that he hasn't done anything that deserves this. Scraping himself with a piece of broken pottery. Folks, those are desert experiences. None of us have ever had to go through those kinds of desert experiences. Think about Daniel being cast into the lion's den. Think about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being cast into the fiery furnace. Desert experiences. Think about Jeremiah who preaches the truth and has the message from God cut up and burned. And then God giving him more of a message and then being arrested and thrown into a cistern that is full of mud up to his armpits. Desert experiences. Think about Hosea. And God tells him to marry Gomer And then she betrays him and plays the harlot. And God tells him, take her back. For it's a picture of how I have loved Israel and taken her back after her harlotry with pagan gods. Desert experiences. You can see the desert experiences of the apostles as we look at early church history. You can see the desert experiences of the apostle Paul. He lists them for us in 2 Corinthians. God takes the people that he will use through desert experiences. The question is, how will you respond when your desert experience comes. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and and tempted God in the desert. Wrong responses. But something else great happened in the desert. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And you know that that is the message of John the Baptist. Matthew 3, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. John was in the desert, preparing the way of the Lord. The Lord was in the desert, being tempted of Satan. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And you know the tests that came to him. And how did he respond to the tests in the desert? He responded with, it is written. When you and I go through our desert experiences... We need to always remember to respond 
with it is written. The word of God is what will get you through those times of testing and those times of trial. We find Jesus many occasions and his disciples in the desert. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Mark tells us, Jesus said to his disciples, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Many places in the gospel speak of that. You know, there are times when each of us has to go to a desert place, not merely to respond properly, but on many occasions to simply refocus on our service for Christ and to remember that he alone is the source of our refreshment. You see, in a desert place, there is no food. In a desert place, there is no water. In a desert place, there is no hustle and bustle of crowds. In a desert place, there is loneliness and no shelter. In a desert place, as we see in Matthew 4 with Jesus, there can be danger, the devil and the flesh. But also in the desert place, there is a still small voice where we can be in fellowship with God. In the desert place, there may be the surprise, as Philip had, of an expanded ministry that we never expected. So when you are in a desert place, be alert. Be expectant for God to do great things. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you for this beautiful picture that we have here, calling Philip away from a great revival, sending him to Gaza, a truly out of the way and unhospitable place, a place with a wicked history, a place with a wicked future. But there you had for him a divine appointment. He didn't question, he didn't hesitate, he didn't doubt. He didn't wait at Jerusalem for further information. He got moving. And he obeyed. Father, help us when we understand your call to get moving and to obey. And Father, help us to be alert and expectant that when we obey you, you will do great things. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.